Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for attending this Nature Careers webcast on learning how to code. My name is Jack Leaming. I'm one of the editors here at Nature Careers, and I'll be your host for the next hour or so. Uh, after this little pre-recorded message, we'll move straight on to uh, to a talk from my colleague, Jeffrey Perkel, about how he started learning how to program on the job um, whilst he was working as a technology editor and before. After Jeff, we'll hear from Julia stewart Lowndes, who'll be talking about her experiences setting up an open uh, programming community and uh, why open programming is the best way to learn programming. And finally, we'll hear from Ju Yong Shou, who'll be talking about his experiences uh, making programming and coding even more open to as many people as possible and why you should try to do something similar. Uh, so those are our three speakers for today. Um, after their talks, which will last around half an hour, we'll move into a live question and answer session um, where we'll answer as many of your questions as possible. If you do have a question for us, please do feel free to type it in in the ask a question box, which should be somewhere around this video player. Um, we will receive those when we go live and we'll uh, look forward to answering as many as we can uh, in about half an hour or so. So thanks so much for coming. I hope you enjoy and I'll hand over to Jeff. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Jeffrey Burkell. I am the technology editor at Nature Magazine, and I'm here to tell you about how and why I started programming. Let's start with the basics. I have no formal training in computer science. I started off on the traditional academic track. I got a PhD in molecular biology from the University of Pennsylvania and did two postdocs studying gene expression in, in immune cells. But towards the end of my third year as a postdoc, I decided that bench science wasn't for me and shifted into science writing. But how did I start programming? Funnily enough, it started with a to-do list. When I was a freelance writer, I used an extremely nerdy text-based to-do list manager to keep track of all my deadlines. Unlike cloud-based commercial systems that locked users into a specific file format and seeming, seemed limited in one way or another, this system was brilliant as far as I could tell. Every article I worked on, was logged there. It had an incredible search capability and I could see at a glance what I had done for individual publications. It was open source so I could see how it worked and it stored my data in a generic text file format so I never had to worry that the company would go out of business and make my archived information obsolete. But when I started at Nature, that system was no longer workable. Nature is a weekly magazine. We work on a calendar. As a freelance writer, the only deadlines I needed to worry about were the dates that my drafts were due. But as an editor, there's more that I had to keep track of. Suppose I want to assign an article for our Ju uh, July 30th issue. Articles in my section go to press a week before the publication date, meaning it would have to be out the door on July 23rd. The sub-editors, who ensure that articles meet nature standards and format them for publication, expect to receive article text two weeks before the press date, which means in this case, the article has to go to them on July 9th. And of course, I need time to edit the article myself. I like to allow myself four weeks, which means that I would need my writer to submit their draft to me on June 11th. When I started at Nature, I would work out all these dates on a calendar, counting backwards by seven weeks to figure out when draft should come in, then logging those dates into an article tracking system. But counting dates like that is tedious. I couldn't think of an existing system to calculate those dates for me, so I decided to try and write one for myself. To be fair, I wasn't starting from scratch. I had dabbled in programming as a graduate student and was familiar with some of the basic concepts, what a for loop was, for instance. And importantly, I knew enough not to be afraid. Programming can be a scary process, but I wasn't gonna trash my computer when I inevitably made a mistake. In 2015, when I was still a freelance writer, an editor at Nature commissioned me to write an article about the rising use of the Python programming language in science. I spoke to several scientists who use Python and asked them about their experience, what they liked about the language and the community around it. Then one source, Titus Brown, a computational biologist who at the time was at Michigan State University, told me that if I was using a Mac, I already had Python installed on my computer. He showed me how to get it running and pointed me to some resources where I could learn more. I ended up taking a free online course at a site called codecademy.com. That experience made the article a lot more fun to research, write, 
and I hope to read. For instance, it turns out that Python is named for Monty Python, the British comedy troupe. And Codecademy, at least, references Monty Python in many of their exercises. So as a result, as a result, I was able to work in a reference to the Ministry of Silly Walks in my article. Once I joined Nature, however, I switched to R. R is a popular language in bioinformatics, and I wanted to learn to use the language in order to test drive some of those tools. I started by reading a book called The Book of R and began working through the exercises. Eventually, I was able to put together a simple program that would accept a publication date and compute the various deadlines I needed to hit to make it. And the program worked. There were no more flipping through calendars. Emboldened by that success, I continued experimenting, and I found that every success, and frankly, every failure, made the next challenge a little easier to solve. As I said, R is a popular language among life scientists. It's particularly useful for working with tabular data such as spreadsheets, which of course are very common in science. One day I discovered that a data scientist named Jenny Bryant had developed an R package called Google Sheets that made it easy to download Google shed spreadsheets to your hard drive. I realized I could use that package to help manage my section. For instance, one of the first things I did when I started at Nature was to compile a spreadsheet listing all the articles I had published in my section. I wanted to know what we had, what topics we had covered and which ones we had not. And I continued to update that spreadsheet as new articles were, pu were published. By writing a program to download that spreadsheet and do some simple manipulations, I was able to document how much I was publishing in any given year. Later, I tweaked that code to document what each author who publishes my section has written or to compare their function, their productivity. More recently, I've used R to help document the diversity of the authors and sources in my section. Over the past several years, diversity has become an important goal at the magazine, ensuring that the diversity of voices represented in our pages reflects the diversity of the scientific community. Code like this helps me to baseline where we are and to demonstrate progress towards that goal. Still, one problem was irking me. My code for calculating uh, due dates could tell me when an article was due, but I still had to enter those dates manually into my planning spreadsheet. And that offended my programmer mentality. I shouldn't have had to do that. Eventually, I found online resources that taught me how to skip that step. Instead of copying dates from one program to another, I used the Google Sheets package to push those data to Google, updating my to-do list program to not just calculate due dates, but to write them to my planning document directly. A focus on programming also helped me to produce better content. In 2018, for instance, I wrote an article about working with geospatial data. As part of my research, I learned just enough about geospatial programming in R to create a couple of small examples. Here we see some research locations in the London area overlaid on a map of geologic features of southeastern England, which come from a project called Macrostrat. I published these scripts and the resulting maps to a code sharing site called RPubs as a kind of interactive supplement to the article, enhancing the experience of reading it. More recently, for an article on tools for making sense of the COVID literature, I used programming to document the magnitude of the problem. Using R and a data set that's freely available from the NIH, I produced the graph that you see here, which served as an infographic in an article written by Matthew Hudson, a freelance writer. And in keeping with the open source, uh, with an open source open science ethos, I published these data and the accompanying, the accompanying code to the code sharing site GitHub. For me, programming has been about trying to solve problems, what I'm calling programming with purpose. If you have a problem you need to solve, and if you think program, programming can help you solve it, here are some things to keep in mind. First, choose a language that your colleagues or others in the field are using. In many cases, any programming language will work for you. But picking one, picking one that your colleagues use makes it easier to understand and use their code and to get help. Second, read other people's code. When you read a paper with an interesting uh, bit of programming, check out the GitHub repository. You can learn a lot just by seeing how other programmers attack problems. Third, if you cannot think of a good problem to solve, check out the open source community instead. Open source software is incredibly widespread in science and project developers are always looking for help. If you've ever looked at a piece of software and thought, I wish it did X, maybe you can take a crack at adding that feature. Fourth, 
Use version control. Version control is the process programmers use to track how their code is changed. It's complicated, but incredibly powerful once you have it running. And if you wish to share your code on sites like GitHub, it's required. Fifth, learn to love Stack Overflow. Stack Overflow is a web forum for programs, programmers, and it's incredibly, uh, incredibly popular. I challenge you to think of a question somebody else hasn't asked and answered before you came along. And finally, check out free online tutorials. One good place to start is Software Carpentry. The organization, which is dedicated to good scientific computing and data science practice, has a ton of free resources available. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for that talk. Uh, we'll now move on to Julia's talk around open data. Hello, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here and to talk about my experience learning to code with open science communities. My name is Julia Stewart Lowndes, and I'm founder and co director of OpenScapes at the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis in the United States. So I'm a squid ecologist by training, and I didn't set out to learn how to code or to learn about open science communities necessarily. My PhD lab was interested in where squid migrated and the impacts that it had on local ecosystems in California and in the Pacific Ocean more broadly. So my work involved a lot of field work to tag, to catch and tag squid, which is what we're doing on the left there. Um, I'm holding a squid that's nearly as big as I am, and I'm re-releasing it off the back of a ship with an electronic tag attached. And later on, we would go back to sea um, and recollect those tags after they had traveled with the squid. So that's what the picture is on the right there. So this meant doing a lot of field work, and um, but then getting the chance to actually hold data in our hands. And, you know, this tag had traveled with the squid wherever it had swum for the duration of the period where the tag was attached. And this let us qu ask questions about where the squid was swimming, how fast it was going, and also how it was breathing, because um, we were collecting data every second, and breathing and movement are coupled through jet propulsion in squid. So it's really exciting to, to be able to hold data in my hand and be able to start to ask my research questions but I had never been trained in data analysis and Excel was the only tool that I knew. And the data that I had was too big to open in Excel. So it was a completely demoralizing experience learning how to code. And I think of myself as first learning how to code in a pretty typical way of a lot of researchers, which, is, which was largely alone and in a, in a panic <laughs> um, and really just to get the job done. But this experience felt demoralizing. It felt like this. Um, this is Luke Skywalker after he crashed his plane into the swamp of Dagobah. And he's here staring at a challenge that he can't solve with the skill sets he has. And it's really demoralizing and lonely. And if you can imagine him attempting to use whatever pulleys or ropes he might have had with him, it wouldn't have been something he was really proud of. It wouldn't have been reproducible, and it probably wouldn't have gotten him to where he needed to be on time. But luckily, what happens is that he meets Yoda, and Yoda uses the Force to solve Luke's problem in a way Luke never imagined was possible. And seeing this and feeling empowered by it is going to open up Luke's whole world, um, because although it's hard work, he can learn from Yoda. He can see what's possible. And he can then take those skills to go on and not only solve his current problem, but also it's going to broaden his whole imagination for what's possible in the future. So Luke didn't go on to defeat the Empire by himself. He had a whole community. And this community is powerful because of the diversity of background and expertise. And so you know, not everyone in this community is a Jedi, but everyone has ways to contribute to this shared vision in really critical ways. And so really, I think of open science and open science communities as being the force. And it's something that enables us as scientists to do better science in less time. It, it enables us to not only get our own data out of that swamp, but to feel confident about it and to build confidence and experiences that will let us broaden our whole scope to the scientific challenges we can tackle. And in environmental science, those those challenges are, are big global problems like 
food security, disease transmission, and climate change. So it's critical that we have the skills and mindsets to work together. For me, I didn't feel this full power of open science and coding communities until after I finished graduate school and joined a research group at NCs, where I still am today. And through our experience um, at NCs, we published our story as our path to better science in less time using open data science tools. So this, this figure here shows kind of our Yoda moments that happened over a period of years as we introduced tooling and practices that improved the reproducibility of our own work and how easily we could collaborate with ourselves and others. And each year it took less time as we incorporated these tooling and practices. And I like to think that we were taught by the community and we practiced this as a team. And, and I think that the, the story still resonates with folks, even though it's four years um, ago now that we published this, but we told a story of not only the tools that we use, but also how hard this transition was for us. And it was hard because it required us to learn new skill sets, um, like learning R and GitHub, but also new mindsets like letting go of our personally crafted systems for how we named files or where we put things and really reimagine the way that we had worked our whole careers. So it was really hard, but it was possible because we trusted each other, because we thought and worked like a team, and because we had really strong leadership, both from our PI and from within the team, this horizontal leadership. And this um, approach has had enduring benefits well beyond data analysis and reproducibility. It's let us reimagine public engagement and science communication and how we collaborate with other people. And it's helped us broaden how we even consider who could be a collaborator and who we can learn from and with and for. So just a few examples of uh, what this looks like to learn with the community. These are three tweets from Twitter, um, from the RStats community on Twitter. And this is a really powerful way to learn use cases and learn new con hear from conversations and also see what people share. So on the left, this tweet caught my eye because this is a figure that I would like to reproduce with my own time series data. So to see the way someone has made transparent data um, outlined, you know, one specific one with color and a label is something I'd like to reproduce. And by seeing this tweet and seeing that it's from the R Open Sci community gives me a bit of, um, uh, it, it helps me vet that this could be a good way for me to work as well. Similarly, there's whole uh, tutorials or, or lessons for learning whole system, whole approaches like GAMS using R. And in this middle tweet, the We Are R Ladies, which is a rotating account for um, women and gender minorities all around the world sharing their experiences with R. And this last one on the right is... Um, is a colleague at um, the fisher who's a fisheries scientist in the U.S. government who's sharing code for how to use animal migration um, and analyze this in R. And so seeing this, you know, makes me wish I could go back to my PhD and leverage the tools that exist now, um, because he's sharing his code and his systems so that even if you're not using that, um, you're not studying that animal, um, the tools he has you can use as well. So I really think about the tooling and practices that go together when you think about learning to code with open science communities. So it's not just learning R as a, as a tool or GitHub as a tool, but really thinking about the practices that other people in the community are using and how those how that can be brought into your team and how you can teach that as well. So that as you work with practices that the community um, does as well, you'll be better suited to to um, start using and explore and discover new tools as they develop, because the software scape is always changing. And how can we stay on top of that and, and help other people um, work with us that way as well? So this community idea is, is a really powerful one for me. These are three uh, uh, top ways I'd recommend folks that are interested in learning more about R, whether they're new um, coders or seasoned coders. 
Um, so it's again, following accounts on Twitter, reading um, Wickham and Grohlman's R for Data Science, and actually also joining the R for Data Science online learning community and, and reading uh, STAT 545 that helps uh, you develop good modern practices with R and GitHub. And also thinking about practices for coding together. Um, I think the strongest advice I can give is to talk about coding and workflows. And through that, you'll identify shared needs that then you can address together. And this will help you think ahead and support each other so that you can be more efficient, open, and inclusive in your coding. And two major ways, I think that just to summarize here, two major ways that open science communities can improve science is first of all, that it, it lets us do better science in less time. And that's science that's more open, more reproducible, collaborative, and easily communicated. And it also helps us feel more included and empowered. I think the feeling of not being alone and having it not be too late for you is a really important um, thing that doesn't get really get talked about when it comes to coding, since so few of us have had formal education in coding. So this feeling of inclusion and belonging is really important. Um, and these two things are really key design elements for OpenScapes, which is the program I founded. And our mentorship program um, really helps research teams realize these concepts as well. So thank you so much um, again for this opportunity. And I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks so much. Thank you, Judy, for that presentation. We'll now move on to Ju Young's talk on accessibility in coding. Hello, I'm Ji Young Seo, an incoming assistant professor in the iSchool at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Today, I'm here to tell some of my personal stories about coding. The purpose of this talk is twofold. First, is to share my learning motivation. Everyone has different motivation to start learning to code. I want to look back how I got interested in coding. By doing so, I will, I will relate it to coding, which is fundamentally problem solving process. Second is to talk about accessibility of coding. When we think about coding, it feels very intimidating and not accessible to everyone. I'll talk about what makes coding inaccessible and how everyone with diverse abilities can start learning to code in a more effective way. So here is the structure of today's talk. First, I will talk about how I fell in love with coding. This will be about how I got interested in computer programming. Second, I will then introduce three types of coding that I experienced for my teaching and research. This part is concerned with how to start learning to code. Finally, I will conclude my short talk by walking you through three nitty gritty coding concepts. And these are universal and fundamental coding concepts that you can apply to any programming languages. All right, shall we get started? First, uh, let me tell you my sweet love story with coding. To do that, let me make my screen go black. Out of blue, my vision was blacked out when I was 10. The classroom where I had romped and studied turned pitch black. I was no longer able to read a textbook, nor was I able to understand what my teacher was explaining in the blackboard. My journey outside of the classroom began with technology, installing screen reading software for the blind on my PC. I began peeping back into sighted culture. I found hope in the bright light of digital technology. And I knew that it would bring me back what I had lost. Assistive technology such as talking software, refreshable bread display, and optical character recognition all enabled me to engage in what I had thought impossible, such as reading books independently, playing computer games, and even writing computer programs and managing a Unix server through a terminal. Long story short, thanks to the digital technology and my passion about computer programming, I now wear three hats. As a learning scientist for a computer science education and the learning technology, and as a RStudio data science instructor, such as Tidyverse and Shiny. 
and accessibility professional like CPA, CC, and NVIDIA expert. I know everyone has different motivation for learning. Mine was just to digitally communicate with the sighted world that I lost. Why not try finding your unique needs for coding? Yes, I understand that coding is not accessible to everyone. Sometimes it's intimidating. So let me introduce three types of coding that I can and you can choose from. The first type is text coding. And this is what you would have normally seen. In most cases, this type of coding is not novice friendly because you have to learn all the details and jargons and syntax for coding. And here is what this code sounds like in speech. Import foo blank list equals left bracket one comma two comma three right bracket dictionary equals left brace quote name quote colon quote tom quote comma quote age quote colon eighteen right brace blank def bar left paren right paren colon print left paren quote hello world exclaim quote right paren blank. According to cognitive science, text comes in through eyes, but is then shunted sideways to the verbal channel. And compared to images that come in through the nonverbal channel, it requires heavy cognitive effort, while much more could be said about cognitive load theory. The key point for our discussion is that people use less cognitive code for images than text. The second type is an image coding. Many learning scientists suggest image coding for novices. Scratch, for example, is one of the most successful visual environments. However, this is not accessible to everyone. While it's block-based and plug and play concept definitely opened the entry door for novices and it's point and click and drag and drop interface made it inaccessible to people who are blind or visually impaired. That issue motivated me to think about and propose and conceptual framework interweaving equity, inclusivity, and accessibility. My main idea was that multi-modalities of multi, uh, making toolkits and diverse material affordances could mediate inclusive collaboration for group cognition by avoiding single mode of dependency and distributing skills among members. The third type of coding aligns with the framework. This is a multimodal coding. To explore the conceptual framework, our research team at Penn State utilized a tangible programming platform called Kibo. Um, we selected this tool for our study exploration because its material affordances align with our perspective on multimodalities. The Kibo kit includes a vari variety of um, sensors and actuators. Here are some um, sensors and actuators which are touchable and programmable. Our research team also um, studied this multimodal coding for teaching programming concept for high school students with visual impairments. And we added braille labels for each code statement so that it uh, was tangibly um, identifiable. Our study suggested multimodal coding could be used as an effective uh, learning tool for coding concepts, regardless of these slash abilities. So I have covered the three types of coding, text, image, and multimodal coding. Choose whatever best meets your needs. Everyone has different level of understanding and preferences. So the choice is yours. Now it's time to talk about the last highlight, the structure of coding. Throughout my experience with a wide range of different programming languages, I have discovered the following three coding components that are universal and can be applied to any programming languages. These are as follows, what, when, and how long. First, what? This is about output and action. This is an essential part of coding. Second, when. This is concerned with input and condition. This is optional. Last but not least, 
how long. This indicates a period condition. And this is also an op optional component. Let's take an example of how we can start coding based on these components. Here is a sentence. I'll be running every 7 a.m. until I lose five kilograms of my current weight. I would like you to identify the three core components, what, when, and how long. First, what is the output and action that you want to take? Yes, it's running. Let's write it down in a programming manner. We can use the verb run. In coding world, a uh, verb is called function. If a verb takes any object, we can put the object inside a pair of parentheses. However, in this case, the verb run does not require any object. So let's leave it blank. What about the second component, when? When do you want to run? Yes, it's 7 a.m. To put this in a programming form, we can use if statement and specify the condition you want to take the action. Um, for your information, I use Python style for this example. So I just put a colon and indented the action block. Finally, how long? How long do you want to repeat this set of program? We want to keep running until we lose five kilograms of current weight. In other words, if current weight is greater than current weight minus five, then we want to repeat. We can express this using while statement. Congratulations, you have successfully mastered the nitty gritty three coding concept structure. Try to apply this lesson to your coding practice. That concludes my presentation. Please feel free to reach out to me at sjysky at gmail.com if you have anything that you want to discuss with me. Thank you all for giving me your attention today. Thanks to Young and all of our speakers. Uh, we'll now move on to our live question and answer session. If you do have any questions for us, please do feel free to type in uh, the ask a question box and we'll get to as many as we can. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope you can see and hear me okay. I can see myself on my screen, so I think I assume that's the case. Hi, it's me, Jack. I am live talking to you here from Nature's offices in London. Um, also on the line, we have all of our speakers. Hello, everyone. If you could unmute yourself, give us a wave. Excellent. Good. I can see you all. Wonderful. Okay. Um, we're going to go straight into some questions from our live audience. Um, if you do have a question, all of those out there watching, please do feel free to just type them in and ask a question box and we'll get to as many as we can over the next half an hour or so that we have left today. Um, I'm going to kick us off with just a really simple question. I'm going to kind of reinforce it. I think this is one that everyone naturally gravitates to when you talk about picking up coding for the first time, which around um, languages. You know, what language do, should I learn if I'm a complete novice and I need to pick something up? Um, Julia, just because I can see you on my screen, can I start with you? Um, would you recommend any you know, specific language from a complete novice, never done any programming before? Um, mm -hmm. what, what would you recommend? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And I, I really liked um, Jeff's response to this, which is see what mm -hmm. your colleagues use or, or what folks around you might use because the languages themselves likely, like the function of, of the languages that you could choose from are often all able to meet your needs, but figuring out what your colleagues use and what the community uses is really a good way to start. Um, that said, I, I think the R community is phenomenal um, and they have been focused a lot on welcoming new learners into that community. Um, so I've found the R community and the R language to be a really good place to start for, for new beginners. Oh, excellent. Okay, great. Um, Jeff, I mean, would you, is there anything you'd add to that to pick particular? I know Julie just quoted you there in terms of just ask what everyone else is using, but I don't, I don't know, have you got any, anything else to add to that? No, I think, I think, I think Julie is right. I mean, it's, Almost any language can solve most problems unless you're doing something very complicated that requires a specific um, 
a specific feature unique to that kind of language. Um, but I mean, certainly scientists typically use Python or R. Um, those are ver they're very accessible. They have open and inclusive communities, and um, there's a good chance if you're using those that your colleagues are using them too. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, actually, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to just build on what you just said there. Actually, in terms of those complicated applications, Ju Young, I wonder you have any thoughts on this? Um, MJ Yogesh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Yogesh, if I pronounced your name incorrectly. Um, they say we're working on um, this particular healthcare data set, um, and we're asking after a, a specific coding tool. Now, I'm not I'm not going to ask you if you could recommend a, a coding tool for a healthcare data set, but I just I'm wondered. I'm curious about the sort of um, those really specific programming languages that people use um, in individual um, scientific pursuits. Uh, you, you gave an example of Kibo, for example, which I, I guess is kind of a designed um, language. And I, I wondered if you had any additional thoughts on, um, I don't know, where, where I could look to find what kind of languages are popular um, in a particular scientific field, or if there's like an index of, of individual programming languages somewhere. Um, Basically, where, where, if I'm interested in kind of specialist programming languages, where do I go? What do I do? I think Stack Overflow is a really good um, a website that we can uh, take a quick overview um, about what programming language uh, is popular um, in a certain field. Um, so, for example, healthcare I data um, in the healthcare, healthcare field, I think R is pretty uh, popular because R is very um, user friendly and very novice friendly, and it has really great uh, visualization um, supporting packages such as G, uh, ggplot2. Um, so, I think depending on uh, fields or needs, I also second um, Jack and Julia's uh, thoughts because um, your peers, uh, they would know the best answer. And if there is anything widely used, I would definitely go with that language regardless of um, the popularity because that also indicates the popularity in your field if your um, friends or peers are using that language. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, Stack Overflow, you're right, is, is a fantastic resource. And we're getting loads of questions in actually from people asking around <clears throat> um, specific problem sets or kind of, um, you know, what yeah, what language should I learn for this particular discipline, that kind of thing. Um, and Stack Overflow, yeah, is it, I, I imagine, a, a wonderful place to start. Um, just to, I guess, build on that, um, Julia, why don't I come back to you? I'm someone. Um, oh, I've lost my question. Ah, yeah, uh, Surya has just asked here if, if there's a good problem set to start learning mm -hmm. coding. I thought this was interesting because I think all three of you spoke about um, picking up a language kind of through necessity or, or through the kind of work you were doing already. But if you're not doing work that really calls for it or you're not in particular circumstances in life that calls for it, how can you start programming? You know, what? where can I, where can I get some problems, get some things to play with? Mm -hmm. I just wonder if you have any thoughts around that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, and like that that motivating factor, I think, is a, is a big, big part of it. Um, so if you, I'd say, you know, a lot of the tutorials that are created online um, and are shared either, uh, yeah, through Code Academy, for example, or through somebody's blog or a, a book that they, they create and, and put online, um, a lot of those tutorials have a data set and have a problem in them that the the tutorial is framed around. And so that can be a good a good place to start and get your, you know, to walk through the problem that they've set you up with, but then you could maybe imagine other other questions from that or, or play around with those data sets. Um, and then also, um, again, <laughs> this is something Jeff mentioned. Um, but the idea of the open source community that will flag little problems that people can help contribute to. And so that could be a, a good step too. Thanks very much. Yeah, I'm, Code Academy, I, I know from personal experience, so I've, I found fantastic just to get a grip of the basics and start learning. And I, I think that does start from like the absolute ground up, right? From as far as I'm aware. Um, 
Jeff, how did you sort of very how did you very start learning how to code? I know you, you spoke a little bit about the need and, and what you started working on, things like that. But where did you where did you pick up those sort of basics, if you don't mind me asking? Um, I think I I think I first started dabbling in it in graduate school, but then you know, you know, it never really went anywhere. But I mean, I learned enough to I learned enough so that when I came back to it, it wasn't completely unfamiliar. Cool. And what 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 yeah. resources did you, you know? What, what did you use to pick those up? Was it like a textbook, or or a, did you did you work with someone? I think. I mean, this was pre. It wasn't pre internet, but it was pre. Um, I mean, it was pre internet as we know it today. So right. I mean, I I bought books. Cool. Uh, and I learned I learned using the language C, which I would not recommend for beginners. It's a, a pretty heavy lift to start. Okay. You, have to, you have to know a lot to start using C. Yeah, starting on hard mode, no internet, and with a with a with a textbook on C. Yeah. Um, excellent. But, right. but like, um, but like today, the R language include like it has like somebody was asking about uh, data sets. R, I believe R has a bunch of built-in data sets already, actually, which is pretty convenient. So you'll see a lot of examples that are using. As a, as a data set about flowers and another data set about cars and everybody uses those to demonstrate certain properties so you can you can do a lot just with the built-in tools oh cool so you actually don't need you don't need to download any sort of additional problems you know you can, you've still got those there to play around with I, I believe so yeah I mean I don't know that, that they have all the that they would represent all the flavors of problems you might want to deal with but I mean certainly like if you want to get started with visualization, there's a lot you can do with those data. I mean, and that's what everybody does is they're, you know, graph things by pedal length or something and and car number of cylinders and that sort of thing. Cool. Excellent. Um, Ji Young, can I, can I go see you um, just on this? Like, so what I'm, I'm looking at all the questions here. And what I'm getting more than anything else is just people asking for, for uh, places to go. You know, like so, Code Academy. We've mentioned um, we mentioned Jeff's textbooks. Is there, is there any other kind of resource that you'd particularly direct people to? to just yeah. to learn how to code. Thank you. Yeah. If, if I <clears throat> narrow down the question to uh, the R, um, I would recommend R for Data Science, written by Hadley Wickham. Um, that is the best. Um, textbook that I've seen and I also um, self-taught myself um, are using that that text material that is free um, online and I also second um, Jeff uh, thought I don't recommend C or any hard uh, algorithm based language the reason why I recommend R or I love R because you can start with visualization so I think um, we can take either top-down or bottom-up approach. I don't think people really need to understand what variable is, what the scope is, local global scope is at the beginning. If we need to visualize something, you can just um, learn and teach yourself um, the required um, steps um, use, um, from a top-down approach. So I would recommend visualization um, in the beginning that would motivate you to start coding. Great, thank you very much. And um, I'm just gonna repeat that, that's R for data science, um, which is R for DS dot, oh, I'm not gonna read out that URL. R for data science by Hadley Wickham. Uh, I just Googled it and it's just popped up, which is handy. Um, so I'll direct people there, thank you very much. Um, I'll stick with uh, with you, Ju Young, and I'm gonna. Oof, I've lost my question again. I do apologise. Um, sorry, hang on. I'm just clicking through all of these questions and trying to find ones that we haven't uh, answered just yet. Oh yeah, this is a nice simple one that I liked. Um, Mac or Windows, Ju Young? Any particular opinion or thoughts? Which is better? Do they both have their drawbacks? Does it not matter too much? Um, just wonder what you thought. Thank you. So, you, is that question about Mac OS uh, usability? What, you, what uh, yes, I, I think so. Just usability in terms of uh, programming. 
Is there any? Uh, yeah, I, I I really love Mac OS because it's basically Unix based. That means you can customize. Um, so the limit is your on uh, the sky is limit. So um, Unix, you know, uh, system is very customizable using shell script. So as um, as long as you are equipped with Bash shell or other Unix um, shell script programming language, you can make your own um, um, customized script on running on your system and you can collect any data. Of course, you can do on Windows as well, but I, in terms of the um, customization, I think um, that provides better um, um, range of customization compared to uh, Windows. Um, but if you use window, I would recommend to you uh, using uh, uh, WSL, uh, Windows Subsystem Linux. That's really great that you can, uh, because you can run Linux on your system. So yeah, my nitty gritty is <clears throat> Unix is really good um, uh, operating system for- Excellent. Programming. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. All right, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna move us on. We're getting loads of questions, so I'd like to thank everyone so much for their questions. And I do apologise if we don't get to all of them, but we'll do our best. Um, I've got a question here from a few people around just time. You know, how long does it take to learn programming to an acceptable standard? Um, Julia, can I start with you? Can you give a, a, any sense? I mean, from your own life, or maybe from mm -hmm. students, whatever. How long? How long does it take? Um. It's an investment. It it does take time, um, and I think I think of it like exercise. You kind of you know you you get out of it what you put into it, and it gets easier um, as you go. But it is an investment, right? Um, and you and it is something you kind of maintain and practice. But um, I I agree with um, uh, I, I really liked the R for data science book and that approach of starting with visualization and then kind of unpacking, like, why was this easy to visualize? It was because of the data structure. Like, what about that data structure? What if the data isn't in that structure? How do you get it in that structure? And then how do you read in files? Like, you know, so sort of working backwards. And um, and so I that approach to learning R has really helped me, um, you know, gain, gain confidence and 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 a bit more fluency, and then I'm able to see patterns within R as I go further. For, further, um, I'm also starting to learn Python now, and I have that gives me this foundation of um, looking for patterns and, and kind of having you know having a bit more confidence to navigate um, in there. And I don't know if there would be an analogy with like running versus swimming, you know, if we're thinking about um, exercise. But I think I think um, seeing not only learning like the coding commands, but the practice and those workflows. And so sort of seeing the way that the R community does that and then also seeing the way Python does that. And I think a lot of it is also around the way you can collaborate and use, you know, something like GitHub to collaborate with yourself and others as you learn right. and that makes it easier. I'm really glad you you, um, you mentioned that actually because someone else, uh, Floor has asked, uh, knowing Python already, um, is it worth also learning R? And it sounds like you think maybe it is worth at least for your for your purposes, learning both. Yeah, I mean, I th I think it comes back to like the the need and the motivation. So I have a need now to to learn more about Python. But what I think is also just so exciting is the interoperability between languages. Um, so, for example, in the R programming language, there's a package called Reticulate that lets you run Python from R. And so I don't need to learn everything about Python in order to start. I can run Python scripts from my, my you know, com the comfort of my R Studio console um, and then sort of learn as I need to, but I don't need to start from the very beginning. Great, thank you. And, and just to summarize that earlier answer, I, I guess what you're saying is it is a continual practice. You know, it's not about mm -hmm. like putting aside a week or a month to learn. It's more mm -hmm. about just using it when you need to and, and slowly kind of building in confidence and ability um, mm -hmm. rather than kind of picking up. Uh, Jeff, you're nodding there. Would you sort of agree with that in general? <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, I mean, J Julia had it exactly right. You, you get out of it what you put into it. So when you start, everything seems to take forever because you make, you know, you just don't understand like where you've made like simple syntax errors, you know, 
you used one equal sign instead of two, two equal signs, or you forgot to close the parentheses or something. But as you get more experience and better able to look at look at your code and, and see why it's not working, uh, it, it, it accelerates rapidly where you're able to quickly you're able to quickly um, you're able to quickly do what you want. I mean, you're able to more quickly do what you want the more experience you have with it. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think that makes complete sense, and um, I like. I actually like that exercise analogy. I think it works. It works well. Um, so I uh, we're getting loads of questions in asking me to repeat the name of that book. So I'm going to do that. That's R for Data Science by Hadley Wickham that Ju Young recommended. R for Data Science. Um, also, we're also getting lots of slightly combative messages from people saying, why not Python, Python or R? I think, I think what all of you are saying is we're both good languages to learn and starting anywhere is better than starting nowhere. Um, I, I, I guess you'd all agree with that. Um, yeah, any other thoughts on sort of that battle between Python and R? Jeff, that's probably a question for you. Maybe it's a feature um, for nature. Well, I've written. I've written about both. I mean, I've written about Python, and I use R. Um, they're both great languages. They both have great communities. I will say, actually, learning both Python and R is confusing because they they have different syntax. So I can never remember, since I use R so much, how Python does certain things. Uh, like the mm -hmm. Python syntax of a for loop is completely is different enough from the way R does it that I always have to look it up. So it's actually easier, I think, to stick with one language unless there's a reason to have both. Thank you. Um, thanks very much. Excellent. Okay, we, we've got a question here from uh, Nicola, which I'm going to direct to you, Ju Young, if that's all right. Um, Nicola asks, is there something that a beginner could do to make their own work more accessible? So someone who um, you know, hasn't necessarily um, got loads of experience in programming, but nevertheless wants to make sure that they're, they're using best practices and making sure their work's accessible. Ju Young, do you have any thoughts on that? So there are, um, is much work um, on accessible coding or accessibility. Um, I would recommend the quorum um, Q-U-O-R-U-M. Uh, quorum is evidence-based programming language um, developed by Andrea Stefik um, in uh, University of Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, so he, he and his team um, has worked on accessible coding language. Uh, so Quorum is one of the great uh, languages that I would recommend to any uh, beginners who are looking for accessible teaching and um, uh, coding kit, uh, coding programming concepts um, for not only blind uh, students, but also other um, students with and without disabilities. So yeah, the Quorum is one good example. And if you are were interested in other accessibility and um, programming language, C ACM SIG Access um, is a great uh, archive that contains a lot of great resources on um, articles. Thank, thank you, that's, that's ACM SIG Access. MCM SIG Access. Excellent. Thank you very ACM, much. ACM uh, Association of Com Computer Machinery. Um, and there is a special interest group for accessibility. So SIG Access. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, great. And uh, I should say probably we're getting many more questions about the book and various other things. So this, this uh, presentation, this recording will be accessible um, after the fact, you will be able to access this video. So if you missed that the first time around, no worries, you will be able to see all of this and the slides again. Um, so no need to worry too much about that. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna flip that question from accessibility to kind of open science, if that's right, Julia, and, and send it your way. Is there anything um, a, a beginner can, can do sort of immediately as soon as they start picking up programming to ensure they're, they're being open and, and using best practices when it comes to making their, their data and coding and things like that open. Thank you. Yes, um, I think I think there's there's many different ways to contribute to open science and the, to practice open science, um, even as you're learning how to code. So I, I think of sharing slides um, with a URL is participating in open science. So 
you know, I think, you know, and sharing videos like we're sharing here, um, asking questions um, or, or listening um, on Twitter. So I, I actually joined Twitter to learn R specifically. Um, and so I started following people who were talking and about R and having conversations. And so I was, I was interacting by listening. And then as I gained confidence, I would, you know, like things or retweet things, which would not only engage with open science in those conversations, but also amplify those voices. And, and so that was a way for me to not only learn, but then contribute to open science um, through Twitter. And then as I was more confident, I was, you know, we're sharing our code via GitHub as we learn those tools and whatnot. But there are, you know, many other ways to kind of join those conversations, you know, share a Google Doc or a, or a blog, you know, and, and point to it via Twitter if you have ideas. Um, so there's a lot of different entry points. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, all right, we've, we've got a, a couple more questions in. Um, we've only got five minutes left, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to just two or three more questions if I can. Um, Jeff, can I ask you this one? Um, a few people have asked around sort of motivation. Um, you know, I, I tried to learn, someone's asked, I tried to learn coding a couple of times, but eventually sort of stop, or sort of fold away. I, I can certainly personally simplify that a little bit. Um, I mean, do you have any advice for that in terms of staying motivated on the, that sort of road um, to learning programming? Um, I mean, it's definitely a, well, first of all, you have to want to do it. Um, and it can be very, I mean, it can be very frustrating. So, I mean, I would say like start small, you know, like a, give yourself a, if you're going to start with, if you're going to start with, um, to try and solve a problem, you know, it should be a relatively simple, tractable problem, not, you know, I, I want to write a game is probably not a, you know, I want to make a graphical game is probably not a realistic way to start. But, um, but, you know, like something like a simple calculator or something to quickly automate a process that, you know, like something relatively simple and tractable and with a defined endpoint is a good way to start. And once you, once you kind of figure it out, then you, I mean, once you kind of figure it out, that gives you a little more confidence for the next time you have to solve a problem. Um, um, I'm not sure if that really answers the question, but I mean, you know, I mean, not everything, not everything can be solved that way. And, and, you know, not everybody needs to learn it and it, and it can be, it is definitely an investment of time. Um, uh, Thanks. But, but you know, personally, I think it's worth it, but. I think that's, I think that's excellent advice actually, personally. I, yeah, I think that's really helpful. Um, thank you. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to move on to the last couple of questions. I'm going to, I'm going to ask each of you this, this in turn, I'd like to share um, maybe the hardest or worst thing. Um, the thing you struggle with the most when it comes to learning how to code and also the best thing, the thing you've, you've really gone out of it. Um, if that's all right, just to sort of end this talk on. Um, why don't we go in the order um, that you've spoken? So, Jeff, if you wouldn't mind going first, if that's all right. Sorry to put you on the spot. The hardest thing about learning how to code and the best thing. Thank you. Um, the hardest thing about learning how to code really is is this is syntax. I mean, the the ideas are pretty simple, right? Like 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 G Young's excellent excellent example at the end there. You know, like you want to run every morning at seven until you lose five kilograms. That's a great example. Um, turning that into functional code, you know, learning the syntax to ask that question is difficult. The best thing about it is when you can kind of quickly sit down and solve a problem and, you know, when you get to the point where you can solve a problem in like five minutes and then it feels kind of like, you know, magic, you know, and then, and then you never have to, then you never have to figure out how to solve that problem again. It, it's a pretty, great feeling thank you um julia can i can i move on same question please yeah um i think the hardest thing was feeling like i could do it and that i wasn't the only person with the problems i had and so kind of the hardest part was kind of having that mind changing that mindset to expect that somebody else had encountered a challenge or even wanted to look at data the way I wanted to look at data. Um, and the the best thing has been that I can ask better questions now, I think. Um, it's really broadened the scope of, you know, if, if it's if it's just as easy to do something a hundred times as it is two times, then think of the, the scope of the questions you can ask. Um, and then especially when you're when you're um, 
able to ask those questions with the open science community. So you're, you know, your questions are not only from two to a hundred, but across different communities and perspectives too. Thank you. Thanks. That's a great answer. Thank you. Um, Ju Young, finally, again, again, sorry to leave you with the last answer, but um, can I can I ask you for maybe the hardest thing and also the, the best thing about learning as a program um, from your experiences? Absolutely. Uh, I also think that the hardest, hardest thing is the uh, is syntax and jargons. So, but that's something that we have to overcome. I, I hope that in the near future, AI would help us uh, in a better way to tackle uh, address those issues, and I'm really hoping that we have we would have more universal uh, programming languages, uh, language so that we don't have to learn all kinds of different uh, variations. Anyhow, the um, best thing is that uh, once you master one programming language, you can tran um, transition your knowledge to into another uh, languages very quickly and easily, efficiently. And you would have um, the freedom of creation. So that's the best thing. Thank you. I, I think that's a, a wonderful point to end on. And um, it leaves me to just say thank you so much to all of our speakers and all of our attendees um, for turning up and, and asking us questions and, and sharing our experiences. Thank you. Um, this conversation will be available online after this event um, so don't worry if you missed anything and um, and yeah thanks so much for coming um, to all of you speakers and all of our um, attendees as well thank you